I feel like blessing the name of the Lord today. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, folks, we have come to the last Sabbath of the year, 2012. And 52 Sabbaths have just passed by. But we can praise the Lord today and say thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. I don't know how many of you want to bless the Lord today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bless His holy name today. Because truly He had done great things in our life. He has sustained us. He has cared for us. He has provided for us. He had healed us. He had lifted up. He had bring comfort and security in time of trouble. He had restored our joy. He had given us salvation. He had given us the everything we need according to his will. And most important, he had given us the fellowship with one another. And for that I praise in the Lord this morning because great is thy faithfulness. And great things he had done in our life. You know, Anne introduced in her prayer, uh, part three. Perhaps I need to preach part three of the judgment hour. But this one is not part three. But I tell you, thinking about it in, an, in a way, it could easily become part three. So let's treat it that way, Anne. Um, let's treat it that way. You know, in the few times that I have been here uh, for the last couple of Sabbaths, we have, been talk we have been talking about the judgment hour. And we have been talking about the, the judgment. Uh, the first part was to understand that the judgment was a process, not an event. Uh, we also learned that uh, the judgment hour is not for the benefit of God. God knows everything. He, he understands everything. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. And, and all life passed before Him before we were even created. And uh, the judgment is for the benefit of His creature. And also we learned that the ju judgment needs to happen because we have a cosmic mess. Uh, the last time that I preached to you about the judgment hour beginning with the house of God, we also learned that uh, God is bringing his judgment upon God's people that have received great lie, but they are not doing anything with that lie that they have received. And uh, we learned that uh, in the Greek there is uh, several meaning for the word judgment but the most severe one is revealed in first peter chapter uh, chapter uh, 2 verse 17 and we learn that um, the judgment begins with us and it's a condemning passing sentence upon those that have received great lie but the question is for today is what are we going to do with this great lie that we have received? I do believe that if we still hear it, it's because God's mercy is upon us. And if we are here, it's because God is saying to each one of us today, Listen, I'm about to bring judgment and I probably you the next one. But I'm extending you my mercy. What are you going to do with my name? In fact, I have learned through the years in ministry that the reason why we exist, the only reason why we exist, is to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Yes, we do all programs and uh, we have a, a fellowship dinner and uh, we embrace each other, but one purpose only is to empower the same, to equip the same. We come together, we study the Bible, we go through the lessons of the, of the Sabbath school, um, we go through teachings, we go through training, one purpose only. That purpose is to bring the good tidings of God to those that are lost. But in order to that 
message be effective in somebody else's life, it needs to be affected in our life first. You see, we cannot give to others what we don't have. We can fake it in front of others. But after a little while, people will know us as we are. And you know that better than I. I, I know that. Uh, we can come and worship God and we come and say, I'm proclaiming the gospel of God. But your life will reflect, if, if your personal life will reflect who you really are. So let me lay out my case before I pray and develop this message that I have with you today, this morning. Evangelism is important in our churches. But it's not the most important thing to do. Yes, we need to do evangelism. Yes, evangelism must be a way of living. But in order for evangelism to be effective in our life, in order to preach the gospel and reach the multitude, in order to do our job well, in order to hear from God in heaven, well done, my faithful servant, we need to experience revival in our churches. So our topic today is, you need revival. But let's bring me in, we need revival. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how much time you have spent in church. We need revival. And we're going to talk about today about revival. Let's bow ahead with me and pray as we open the word of God. Father in heaven, what a joy. Coming at the end of this year and be here in your house worshiping you. With friends and families and uh, uh, we we want to praise you. We we want to praise you, Lord, for the many things that you had done for us. We want to praise you because every day your mercies are new. Your kindness toward us is new and refresh every day. Blessings, new blessings, are on the table for your children, and we praise you today for that, Lord. Now we have a message to share with the world. 2013 is nearby. New challenges will arise. The powers of darkness will attack the church even in a deeper level. But by your grace, we will be able to stand. Because it's not by mind, not by power, by thy Holy Spirit in our life. That we can be overcomers for your name and glory. Give us understanding as we open your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last year. Last year, no. I'm, I'm thinking about this year last. We have two more days to go. It sounds like. Last Wednesday, I was in Coquit, and they tell me, see you next year. And it caught me by surprise and said, whoa. Uh, but yes, we are right in the corner. This year, 1,293 churches in North America, Seventh-day Adventist churches conducted an evangelistic series. Praise the Lord for that. I don't know. I, you guys don't get excited about evangelism. What's wrong with you guys? Let me, try, let me try it again. 1,293 churches in the North American Division conducted an evangelistic series. You know what that means? They are fulfilling. They are in obedience to the Word of God. Go out and preach the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be doing. In fact, this research uh, blew my mind. Uh, when, I, when I was looking uh, through the North American Division page, what, uh, the page, um, I find out that 503 churches for the first time after five years, for the first time after five years, they conducted again an evangelistic meeting. And that is something to praise the Lord because I do believe that the, we're only going to reach the end if we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I'm so proud of the church today. I'm so proud that many good things are happening around the world because faithful people are going out and they are proclaiming the three angels' message. And they are saying, fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has just come. I'm so proud to see many young people conducting uh, an evangelistic meeting for the first time in the North American division. Lay led churches have been, uh, have been running for the whole year. Just lay people running churches, preaching the gospel, preaching evangelism. And that is a great news for each one of us. But I want to tell you something about this statistic that blew me, blew me, blew, uh, blow me away. Thank you for your kindness and patience. Maybe 2013 will be a better year. We have increased in evangelism, but our churches are decreasing in revival. We are having larger churches that are taking longer for the members to know each other. We have people that come to church. They have been in the pew, sitting in the pew. They are members of the church for, the, for six months, seven months. And after all that time, people get to know them. We are increasing in proclaiming the gospel, but we are decreasing in, in revival. And let me tell you something, evangelism without revival is a chaos in the making. We need revival, and when we are revived, when we do evangelism, people are transformed by the power of God. It is my personal observation as, 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 a, as the body of Christ that evangelism is increasing, revival is decreasing. But I want, you, I want to talk to you about revival today. Yes, this coming year we're going to do another evangelistic series. But I want to start this new year with, church, with the Church of Kenyon Memorial, Revive in the Lord Jesus. Let me talk to you about the difference between evangelism and revival. Revival, listen to this, revival is what happens to the same. Evangelism is what happened to the lost. When a lost person comes to Jesus for the first time, they have this fire in, in their bone, in, in, in their soul, and they are eager to learn. And you see a new, a new person when he comes to church because they want to be participating in everything. They want to be involved in everything. They want to proclaim the gospel because they knew something that they have never learned before. Amen. That's evangelism. Revival, on the other hand, is when you that have been sitting in the church for 30 years, God take hold of you and he said, let me show you my son and my daughter a new dimension of who I am. And you begin to fill again with the power of the Holy Spirit. A heat became to fill you in and God take hold of you and you begin to worship God in a new dimension. That is revival. Evangelism is winning soul for Jesus. Revival is winning members for Jesus. We have too many members that are sitting in our pews that are totally lost. They come to church. They have a new, uh, a, 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 a really shallow relationship with God and Satan is taking over them and destroying them and tossing them down from one point to another and their life is seen to be falling apart constantly. You talk about how you're doing it. Oh, I'm doing. But when you are revived in Jesus Christ, God take you in a different level. And the Bible says no one can touch you because you are in Christ. Jesus evangelism is a sin of repenting revival 
is a member repenting. I remember I love to do evangelism and, and every time that I do evangelism we see all new people coming with tears down in, in their eyes and they coming down the aisle and they are giving their life to Jesus and those that have been sitting in the church are looking at them and say, oh wonderful, look at that beautiful thing that happening. Oh praise the Lord, that's a wonderful thing. But I tell you that is evangelism. Revival is when you are sitting in the pew and the Holy Spirit is holding you tight. And suddenly, out of a word of a sermon, out of the word of the Bible, the Holy Spirit shake you down. And tears come into your eyes and you says, I need to act something new into my less of conviction. I need to change something. And then you come down the aisle. That is revival. There is a big difference between an evangelist and a revivalist. The primary call of an evangelist is to call the lost to have light in Jesus Christ. A revivalist is for, for the revivalist primarily job is to call people to focus themselves in the life that they already have. See, the problem with the judgment hour is that many people have received the light, but they are not doing anything with the light because they need revival. Evangelism is, is the loss being charged and changed. Revival is the same being charged and changed. When we have newcomers coming to our church and we see, we see them so excited, we see in them the things that they need to change and we judge them and we see, oh, this person dress needs to be cut down and this thing had to be fixed and this thing. But when was the last time, when was the last time that you added something to your conviction list, you members of the church that have been in the church for many years, when was the last time that you checked yourself and said, let me do a checklist on my spiritual inventory list to see what is missing in my relationship with the Lord. I'm no longer satisfied with level C. I want to go to level B and eventually I want to be in level A because let me tell you something when you receive Jesus in your life, the light that you have received is increasingly every day. That's why Paul says the old man gets all outside but the inside renew itself every day and folks let me tell you something it is my desire that this coming year the Kenya Memorial Church is renewed revitalized that God may do great things in our life for the for his glory and honor Amen. I love to see this show call call uh, overhaul I don't know if you have seen this show overhaul What's wrong with you people? You need to see that. How many of you like cars? Let me see those who like cars. Well, overhaul, let me explain to you this show. Maybe give you a little appetite for some good program. But this show is, is all about uh, a person that in the city that have a very old car. But that car is all beat up. It's rusted. It, the engine sometimes doesn't run. I mean, it is in really bad shape. But he keep that car because he knows that that car have a, an amazing value if it is restored. Now the show is all about that they go to that house because some member of the family call overhaul. And it says, my husband have a car that wanted to fix for a long time, but he don't have the money, he don't have the talent, he don't have the, the time. And they come and they steal that car from that person. And they overhaul it. They take it to a place, and, and, and the beautiful thing is they strip the car down completely. And it takes a week. 25, 30 professional, well-trained, equipped, high-tech technology people to change the same car into a new car and after the week is done 
they prank the person a little while and they, they, they tell the person, you know, your car has been stolen and they mess it up with the person for a little while and the person that had that car is suffering. But on the seventh day, they call him and they said, we have your car. You have been overhauled. And that person then goes to that shop with their eyes closed and he sees for the first time his old beat up car brand spanking new every time that I watch this show I, 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 I stop thinking I don't stop thinking about Lord I need some overhauling in my life you know, at one time I received the gospel and I became this brand new baby car that it was wonderful. Everybody wanted to ride on, everybody wanted to, to sit down inside and everybody, oh, it was a show. It was something nice to drive a brand new car that Jesus had put in you. Bear with me, I'm just showing you something here. But as time passed by, it doesn't matter how, mu how much you know about the Bible. Sin is, is, is so amazing. Sin is not what you do, by the way. Sin is who you are. And you become, you become, you, you, you start, uh, you, and you become uh, failing. And your transmission is no longer getting the, in gear. Uh, you start a uh, big smoke coming out of the, 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 the exhaustion and, and, and you become to be an all beat up seven day Adventist member. Revival means God, somebody, somebody, and I praise when someone prays for somebody else. That's why we need to pray for, 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 for people in our church. When somebody call on the Lord say, Lord take hold of somebody. Take hold of me. Then God take, God take you in. And he overhaul your soul. And he remove your stunning heart and give you a flesh, a brand new spanking heart. He changed your transmission. Your car was five speed. Now he give you six speed. He put new tires, new rings, a beautiful spanking car that comes fresh is all but new everybody want to ride on you because you have been overhauled see the problem with the evangelism is that we do evangelism but we are the all beat up cars I remember one of the greatest danger listen listen to listen to me folks for a few minutes one of the greatest danger to have an evangelism without revival in a church one of the biggest problem we find in the church today is that when we do evangelism we spend money we bring people to church we teach them the truth listen the truth we teach them the truth then we ask them to join us and then they become like us. The problem is that us is not pleasing God. Us is an abomination to God. Us is God saying, I will spit you out of my mouth. We need to be overhauled by Jesus Christ. We need to be transformed by the power of God. I remember uh, this preacher that um, didn't do too, much, too many evangelistic series. And everybody was picking on him. Uh, every time we have pastors meeting, everybody reported how, how many evangelistic series they had done. And this pastor, it was very open, very honest. He said, no, I have not done evangelism for three years in my church. And everybody started looking at him kind of weird, you know, because our mission, our purpose in life is to do evangelism. It's to preach the gospel. And uh, some of our... Our colleagues begin to question him, and, uh, and I remember one day he was very patient, very loving pastor. He said to us this, that opened my eyes. He said, you know, I, I, I have a great passion for evangelism. I believe in evangelism. I believe that that is a way of living, of life. It's not an event, it's the way you live. But more than that, I want you to, 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 to see something how I see it. And then he said, 
A church that doesn't have revival, I would not do, that's what he said, I would not do evangelism in my church unless I have revival in my church. We said, what is that? Well, a church that doesn't have revival is like uh, having a whole bunch of rotten apple in one place. When you do evangelism without a revival, it's like taking a new brand, new apple that God had changed and had given them a new heart and throw them down, down into a whole bunch of rotten apples. You know what will happen? You add to the church more bad apple in the long run, he said, because it is the law of the human mind that by beholding we become change. If, if they behold lack of commitment when they come to church, if they behold lack of love for one another, if they see that constantly we're criticizing each other instead of preaching and proclaiming the gospel and loving each other, if they see the lack of interest for the things of God, if they see, if they see themselves, uh, if they see in us Christians walking in darkness, if they don't see the transparency in the relationship with the Lord, they become like us but because by beholding they become changed change and eventually you will have more rotten people in sitting in the pews if you're wondering sometime church why God have not added more people to the church is because the church needs revival we cannot preach the gospel unless we experience the gospel ourselves doesn't have any effect on other people if that gospel is not in us listen carefully the bible clear says that this gospel of the kingdom of god will be preached by testimony sister wise says that a life well lived is better than a hundred well preached sermon listen you can hear a hundred good preacher a hundred good sermon for the best preacher ever but if that life doesn't live in tune with the gospel is useless it become like a like a like like nothing it become like uh simbolo que retiñe how do you say that you know what the bible says if you have love if you don't have love you become like uh, a tickling symbol so we need revival so folks i want you to do something this week I do believe that we have a great opportunity. You have been called by God. Listen carefully, all of you, even our visitor, because let me tell you something about our visitor. The Bible in Revelation have a text that says this. The spirit and the bride says, come. This is not for members only. It's for everybody that hears. God says you are called to call. You are called to come. You are called to be transformed first. We need revival in our churches. Oh Lord, revive my soul. You know, in Psalm 80, we read this text. Psalm 80 verse 19 says, restore us. Restore, I went and look at the dictionary, the word restore is restore to be used, to refurbish, to bring validity, to bring back something that was useful, useless to use. David was saying in Psalm, he was crying out to the Lord and he says, O oh Lord, restore, refurbish, bring validity back, O oh Lord of God of hosts, that we may be saved. Listen carefully. If you know the Lord but you don't have constant revival in your life, you will fall back to your old nature. Now let me show you in the Bible an example of that. Someone that lost sight of the Son. By the way, when you lose sight of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ is not lifted in the congregation, when we preach about everything else other than Jesus Christ, the church will lack revival because only person, the only person can bring revival to your soul. The name is Jesus Christ. And 
through the power of the Holy Spirit, he reveals the deeper sides of God. You know that the angels of heaven are revived constantly by the love of God. One of my favorite quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy says that angels are singing 24 hours. Think about this. And they put it in a term that we understand because in heaven time is not limited by time. But in order for us to understand, Sister Y mentioned and, and she said this. In angels, the heavenly hosts are singing holy, 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 holy. And they are singing that constantly seven days a week for eternity. Can you imagine that? I, I, I think about that. Uh, I, uh, um, the other day, my daughter Kelsey was singing uh, at home. And she is kind of like me in, a, in that sense. When we like a son, we like to repeat that son a lot. To the point that that beautiful song become, becomes annoying to the hearers around. And Kelsey was singing, Mary, do you know? Mary, do you know? And I was watching Ditches at, at, at home and she was in the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the living room. Mary, do you know? And I sent her to the room. I went to the, uh, sent her to the room and in her room she was, I guess, more excited about Mary and she sang a little louder. And it got to the point that was a very, very annoying by her singer, singing. You know, in heaven, the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. And she's saying different pitch, different tone. They don't get tired of repeating holy, holy. And nobody is annoying around them. You know why? Because she said every single moment they see a new dimension of who Jesus is. Listen, Christian. If you come to church but you don't have a revival, if you don't see Jesus' new dimension every day, you're missing a lot. Your brand new spanking car will get old. No longer will be beautiful to ride on. Every day we need to be overhauled by Jesus. And it is my desire that as we begin this coming year, we get overhauled by Jesus. Let me give you a quick verse from the Bible. Let's open our Bible. And you know the story. Because of time, I would just glance over of a man that needed revival in his life. In fact, he received revival twice. Bible records two times when he revived. The Bible says revive his soul. The first time that he, he was called by the name Jacob. You know, uh, you know the story. Jacob, all his life, he didn't have an easy life, by the way. Jacob was always the second in second place I don't know if you have brothers and sisters but being second is not always good and he always was the second and even in even when he was in his mother's womb they were fighting they were twin with Isa you remember the story and they were fighting even in the womb and when he came out he wanted to be the one that was blessed it was a blessing special blessing for the the, the first child and he didn't have that opportunity to born first he was just second behind his brother but he was not the first one and all his life he longed for a blessing and and he cheated on his brother he took advantage of his brother because he wanted a blessing you remember the story he lied to his dad because he wanted a blessing and it got to the point that he did it so imp so passionately and he he pursued that even in his error even in his mistake he was blessed first but you know the story the story goes that when Esau realized that his brother was blessed and he took his blessing. He promised in his heart, I will kill my brother. And he had to go out of the house that he grew up. He never again saw his mother. 
and he was in a place and this is what I want you to see the story now it's in, in Genesis chapter 32, 32 verse 24 turn with me over there Genesis chapter 32 verse 24 he had the blessing listen listen to this he had the blessing of his daddy I, I want you not to miss this point because I believe all of us have received the blessing of our daddy Jesus Christ but unless he received the blessing of the daddy but unless we have an encounter with the son that blessing is not activated in our life Do you follow what I'm saying here revival you have been blessed when you were born again, when you came to the church, when you entered the, 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 uh, the church, when you were baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon you. God gave you talents. God gave you blessings. He said, I know the future that I have for you, but unless that is not activated, unless Jesus Christ put the switch on, turn the switch on, you have the power. The power is running. All the electricity is coming down onto that point over there. Power is there. But it's not on until you have an encounter with Jesus Christ. His daddy blessed him. He have all the birthright. He took it away. God says, I will, his father says, I will bless you. You will be a great nation. Out of you, many people will be blessed. He have all the blessing. But he missed one big point. He needed to have an encounter with the son of God. And you know the story. He was right, right beside the river Hypokin. And he was there, and he was uh, in distress. He was agonizing in his heart. Uh, he was uh, with fear. He have God bless him. He got uh, uh, everything he wants, so to speak. But he was uh, filled with anxiety. He didn't have any joy. He knew that his brother was coming with 400 men. And, uh, and he was afraid. And he was in a desperation. And at that time of desperation... God appears to him. The Bible says Jesus himself came. And I want you to see what happened. Let me suggest this to you. Let me read it. Verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone. I don't care how much blessing you may have in your life. Without Jesus you will be left alone. I don't care how many how, how many years you, you are sitting in the church, how many knowledge you have about the Bible, how many talents you exercise in the church, how busy you are. Have you seen people that are busy around people, but they are a lonely person? They are lonely people? Because the only one that can feel the emptiness of our heart is Jesus Christ. And he was left alone. And a man wrestled with him unto the breaking of the day. Now I want you to see this. The whole night, son angel, Jesus Christ came down. And he began to wrestle with, with Jacob. Jacob was in a desperate situation. Jacob had the blessing. But he had not recognized the source of his blessing. He had not recognized that he needed revival to activate the blessings in his life. He was a rusty car and he needed to be overhauled by Jesus Christ. And he was wrestling. And at a point in life he came when he realized that he was not wrestling with a human being. He was wrestling with the Son of God. And he says, let me go because it's morning and I have to go because you will realize who I am really. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you overhaul oh my soul that I may be revived in, within me and the Bible says that at that point in time the angel of God praise the Lord that God is a master in changing who you are you pass God changed you pass and the angel of God Jesus himself said to him tell me your name I'm the usurper 
I'm the liar. Yes, I have all this many blessings. But see, sin has taken over me. And I become the usurper. I become the liar. I become the deceiver. I become those that are running away. I, I, I have all this blessing. I have all this animal. Oh yes, I have all the blessings. But I need to turn that blessing into, into something meaningful in my life. Jesus said, tell me your name. It is my desire that today you are overhauled by Jesus. And Jesus come to you and said, tell me your name. And he called him. He says, no longer your name will be Jacob. But your name will be Israel. And Israel means in Hebrew, the father of many nations. God activated revival in his soul. And because he was activated by God in his soul, God says, because of you, people will be blessed. Because of you, the gospel, you will become the father of many nations. Even today, folks, yes, the folks over there in Israel are, are, are all messed up, but all of them are, are claiming Jacob as their father, Israel as their father. They got, at least that got, that got right, because God says, they become out of you. They were blessed. Now, time passed by, and Israel had a successful life. In fact, everybody that trying to fight against him, God took it away. He was blessed with 12 sons. Remember the story? Now bear with me, I almost done. But this is what amazed me. One day, this blessed man lost sight of the sun. Now feel me out what I'm saying here. Because we know that the Bible says that everything that is written in the book is for our teaching. And beginning from Moses all the way to the prophet, the Bible says they say things concerning to himself, meaning to Jesus. And Jacob... Israel had lost sight of his son because their brother, his other son, took Joseph away. You remember the story. And they came to the father and they said, Father, your son, your favorite son had died. By the way, that is a, a, a wonderful uh, illustration of Jesus because the Bible says that Jesus was di de uh, died because of his brothers. Their brothers killed Jesus. And he became depressed. And I want you to see something amazing. God called him Israel. God changed his name. But when he lost sight of the son, he went back to be Jacob. Now I want you to read it with me. Look, look at what it says. Uh, turn with me real quickly to uh, Genesis 45. Verse 25. The time came when, uh, when Joseph revealed to his brothers... And um, he said, go back, to, go back home. 20 years had just passed by. And now God told him, uh, it is time for you to... Uh, Joseph told their brother, it is time to, to go back and tell dad that I'm alive. Look what it says in verse 25. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan. Jacob to Jacob their father. Now they shouldn't say Israel their father. Because God changed his name. He was no longer Jacob. He was now 
Israel. But let me tell you what happened. Yes, Jacob, Israel continued to be a Christian. He continued to offer sacrifice. He continued to get up in the morning. He continued to teach their children. But he had lost sight of his son. And for 20 years, he became depressed. For 20 years, he won nothing else. For 20 years, he was always saying, I will go to my grave mourning because I have lost my son. In fact, when they went to Joseph, he said, we don't want our, our, our youngest brother to, to suffer anything to him because we don't want to see the pain in our father's eye again. Remember the story. Now, he went back to Jacob. Now, he was restored. Look how revival come into his life now. Verse 25 says, And when they went out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan, to Jacob their father, and they told him, saying, Joseph is alive. Now watch this. And he is a governor. And over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart, listen to this, stood still because he didn't believe them. Jacob said, you are fooling with me. He's dead. He's not alive. Verse 27 says, But when they told him all the, one, the words which Joseph has said to them, and when they saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, now listen to these words. The spirit of Jacob revived. He was overhauled because Somehow, he got again the picture in his mind, the son is alive. I'm going to reunite with him. I'm going to see him again. And the spirit of the old Jacob, that he went back to be Jacob, revived. The Bible says revive. But look, look, at, look at what it says in verse 28. Then Israel, wait a minute. It's Jacob. It's not Israel. What do you mean it's, it's, it's Israel? Yes, because when he got a hold of the son again, when he saw that the son was alive, when he knew that the son was still living and reigning and in power, and he was calling him to go home, his spirit was revived, and the old Jacob went back again to the new Israel because God revive his soul the saying is with the church today when we lose sight of God in our daily life when we steal that he's dead and listen to this not because we said that he's dead we don't say that he's dead we say always that he's alive but our action reflect reflect otherwise with our minds and with our soul and with our action we are saying God is dead for me but let me tell you, folks, during this 2012, God has sent wagons of provisions. He has sent, He has sent His mercy. He has sent His kindness. He has stood by your side when you were in trouble. He sent His holy angels to protect you that your feet may not stumble in the ground. He has given you life. He has restored your soul. And wagons of provisions are coming. And yet, a message is coming from heaven today. I'm still alive. I'm still reigning. I'm still God. Yes, you have been in trouble. Yes, you have been in difficulties. Yes, the economy goes down. Yes, there have been many killings. But I'm still alive. I'm still reigning. I'm still in control. And our Bible says that our spirit, when we get hold of Jesus, is revived. And we become out of Jacob. We become the new Israel for the glory of God that's why Romans chapter 7 verse 6 says we serve God in the newness of spirit that means that we are renewed not in the oldness of letter when we lost sight of the son 
If we don't watch it, we are start serving God out of the oldness of religion, not out of the newborn again experience, the newness, the passion of God in our life. A beautiful son says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look fully in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth, this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of the glory and grace. Satan's have taken away our joy. You have been blessed by God, my friend. For you are a child of God. You have been chosen before the foundation of this world. But those blessings will not be acted in your life if you don't get revived in Jesus' name today the son is alive he's alive that is why we should not be discouraged that is why paul says if in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 14 says if christ have not been raised from the dead our preaching is useless and our faith is in vain he's alive and he is well he conquered hell he conquered demon. He conquered principality. He conquered disease. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He is alive and he is ruling. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is reigning and he is coming back again. And he is saying today to the Jacobs of Kenya Memorial, turn back to Israel because you have been blessed. And God is calling you now to use that blessing and preach the good news to others. There is hope. In Jesus Christ. In Titus 3 verse 5 says. No by work of righteousness. That we had done this. But according to his mercy. We have been saved. And we have been watched. And regenerate. Listen to this. Regenerate. Means you have been back to new. He have created something new. And in renewing of the Holy Ghost. Let me finish. I'm telling you that revival <coughs> must need to happen. I experienced the other day, well, the other day, not uh, a while back, something nasty happens to me. I went to a restaurant, and when I ordered my drink, and somehow, I don't know how they got confused, and they brought me unsweet tea. Unsweet tea is nasty. <laughs> I don't like it. Some people like unsweet tea, but I don't like it. I tasted, it and it was it was it was terrible. Uh, it, that that bothers me so much that I learned how they make tea. By the way, you know that they we heat uh, tea to make it, then we put ice to cool it down. Then we put sugar to make it sweet, and then we put lemon to sour it. <laughs> That's how we make tea. Yes. But they brought me unsweet tea. And I wanted to try. I try. And you know, if, when, the, when, they bought you unsweet, the, when they brought you unsweet tea, you know, those, you have those little packages that you dump it inside. You had to dump, and this is sugar. It's not sugar. It's what? What is the other name? Yes, whatever it is. But it takes like thirty of those to to make the tea sweet. And then you you you, you store it up, and you drink it. And it, it, after that happened, it, it's 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 okay. But. This is what I experienced. If I leave it on the table and I was talking. And you know, when you talk for a little while, all the sugars goes down. And when you try it again, it's nasty. I learned something that brought revival to my soul. The problem with the churches today is not we are the we are like the unsweet tea. We are nasty in our nature. Paul says we are filthy rag. 
And hey, by the way, if you don't know what filthy rag mean, when Paul write, wrote that, he was talking about the menstruation of a woman. We are nasty. But the Savior had to come and put sugar in it. And the sugar is the Holy Spirit. You know when, when you are okay? You know why we are okay when we come to church? Because the Holy Spirit takes hold of us. If otherwise, we wouldn't be killing each other inside the church. But you know what happened when we have the Holy Spirit in our churches? And we're sitting in our pew for many years, seeing others coming down the aisle and nothing happened to us. Jesus settled down. And when you try the tea, it's unsweet. Do you follow what I'm saying? And I learn, folks, I learn, and go to the piano, I learn. That is not the sugar what makes it sweet. Is the stirring what makes it sweet. You have Jesus in your heart. But if you don't stir up Jesus. If you don't get up in the morning and say, My soul long for you, O oh God. As a deer is longing for water, my soul is reaching for you. You become unsweet. Then you do evangelism. People come to your church and for a little while everything is look nice and wonderful. But when they get to know you, they get out of here and they don't want to come back. Because you become unsweet. But as a church, if we stood up every day, we go to Jesus and we said, I'm Jacob. I stood up my heart. Make a, 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 a overhaul of me, Jesus. Then you become a new creature. And you become a blessing. And Jesus will say to you, because of you, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And because of you, I will do great things and you will become the father. You know what that means? The father of many nations. I will give you the privilege to have a lot of people under your bell. Not because of you, but because Jesus is living within you. Church, we are about to enter 2013. And yet... This year we had done wonderful things. But I do believe with this church, the best is yet to come if we stood up Jesus in our heart. If we put our prejudice on the side, we start criticizing each other and nitpicking in the things that are insignificant. If we put our eyes on Jesus Christ, we're going to be transformed into a new creature. And great things will happen for our Lord Jesus.